Good morning. It's good to see you this morning. I'm so happy that you're here. We've got a good group in here today, and we've got a good group over next door. And so thank the Lord for those that have uh, come out today to worship the Lord. We're here for one reason, and that is to exalt the Lord today. Uh, I have a, a couple things I want to share with you, then I'm going to read some scripture. First of all, if you're our guest today, we're thrilled that you are here and uh, encourage you to come back and visit with us again. Uh, sign the book if you don't mind when you're on your way out. That way we have a record of your uh, visit with us. Uh, also, I want to give uh, extend a word of thanks to you for collecting so many school supplies uh, for our church uh, friends down at Red River Church uh, down in Marksville. Uh, thank you for helping to do that. We had to order many more supplies on top of that to be able to do what we needed to do. But we had so many that were given, so thank you. Um, but I'll, I want to say a special thanks to uh, those that actually went down there Friday. They had a nice, cool job down there on Friday. Everything we did had to be done outside. And um, so with masking up and gloves and outside, uh, it was quite warm. But I'm grateful to Tim Thomas, Carl Castle, T.K. Smith, Nancy Brooks, Renee Pickens, Sue Denton, James and Martha uh, Truel uh, for going with us down there. And uh, thank you for your hard work and, and a very, very hot day. But they were so appreciative of all of the uh, uh, school supplies, and so thank you. I want to extend that to you and say thank you for that, okay? Um, so I want to remind you that, uh, I, I, where's, where's Jillian? When did we dismiss Children's Church last time? I keep forgetting now that we got this different schedule. Okay, so right Okay, right before Tracy comes to sing, which I'll let you know, I'll know when Tracy comes and I'll, I'll dismiss the children's church. I forgot last time. And we'll dismiss those going to children's church and so forth. All right, so take your Bible and turn to Psalm 46. Psalm 46. We need this passage today. Oh, how we need to remember this. Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength. A very present help in trouble. Therefore, what? What does it say? Therefore, we will not what? We will not fear. There's a lot of fear today. Therefore, because he is our refuge, we will not fear even though the earth be removed. The earth hasn't been removed yet. Even though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, Though the waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling. Look down to verse 7. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Verse 10. Word for all of us today. Be still and know that I am God. So whatever's going on in your life right now and all this crazy stuff that's going on in our country with all the rebellion and anarchy, and all the COVID and all of that, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. And I'll preach later, so I'll stop there. But that's good stuff. So let's pray. And then Brother Larry is going to come and lead us. Father, thank you so much for the fact that you are our refuge and you are our strength in these troubled times in which we live. Lord God, we know that we need not fear because you are with us. God, I pray that we won't live in fear, but instead we will live in trust, that we will place our faith and trust in you. Lord, we know that you're in control. We know that, this, that all of these things that we're seeing, they're leading us right on in to the second return of the Lord Jesus. We've read the book. We know that it's, it's stated in the book how things are going to be. Lord, we cling to you. We trust in you. And Lord, we worship you. We adore you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
pastor said, God is with us. We can't worship him enough. And that's what we're going to do this morning as we sing. Listen to this. I'm going to sing it one time through, and then I'm going to ask y'all to stand and sing it with us. This is the time when true worshipers will worship here. And these are the days when my Father's way This is the hour when the Spirit's power will move again. As we worship Him in spirit. This is the time when true worshipers will worship Him. And these are the days when my Father's way.
the opportunity to worship you this morning. Let's sing together. Let's just continue to lift him up. Let's sing. Holy, holy. Go! 
crucified with Christ, therefore I no longer live. Jesus Christ now lives in me. I am crucified. through 29. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, In Isaac your seed shall be called, concluding that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshipped leaning on the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the departure of the children of Israel and gave instructions concerning his bones. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing of pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith, they passed through the Red Sea as, they, as, as by dry land, whereas the Egyptians attempting to do so were drowned. Please pray with me. Dear Father, we just thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the, the wisdom that you give to us, dear Father. We, we just pray that you'll help us to have, uh, that you'll give us the wisdom to, to see what is right, what is blessed and and how we should act as far as as christians should act dear father we pray for our country today dear father we're in so need of of your pouring out of the holy spirit upon our country 
that um, we just ask that you help us as a, as a nation, dear Father. Help us to turn back to you. Father, give each one of us the faith that we need to endure, that we need to yes. continue on in, in your strength and your word. Father, just thank you again for all your many blessings. Uh, forgive us of our sins now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you, Brother Gary. Before Tracy comes to sing, our children will now be dismissed to go to Children's Church. You can follow Miss Jillian right there. While they're heading out, I was going to mention that um, I'm going to sing one of the hardest hymns in the hymn book in front of you to sing. It doesn't have a tricky rhythm, and it, the notes aren't hard to hit, but the message of it is the greatest challenge, and it's always hard for me to sing it because it's I Surrender All. And um, just know I haven't reached that um, in this life because of our flesh is weak, but that it is and should be all of our prayer, especially now. All to Jesus I surrender, all to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily. Oh,
What a challenge that we've just heard. All to Jesus I surrender. Boy, we probably just need to get really honest right here at the beginning, huh? Isn't that really where we need to start? What is it in our life that is not surrendered to Jesus? We need to take it to him at the altar now. You don't have to necessarily come forward, but you have an altar right there where you are before God. That area of your life that you know that as she was singing that, if you were paying attention, she was singing that. Some things the Holy Spirit would speak to you about need to be dealt with. So let's deal with those things as we, as we continue to move forward in our time of worship today. I want to ask you to take your Bibles and turn to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. Imagine this. Imagine getting a letter that's really a letter from Jesus that John simply records it. Imagine that Sweetwater Church gets a letter and it's to be read to the church from the Apostle John that Jesus speaks and he says, when he speaks to them, he says, I know that you live in a place where Satan's headquarters exist. That's the word that's going to go to the church at Pergamum. We could very well, I think, identify with that today. More and more so, more than any other time in my life, I see this letter speaking to the church today in which we live and where we live. Pergamum became a city that was known as Satan's headquarters in our country today. There are cities throughout that I'll not name, but you can reflect on, that could very well be called cities of Satan's headquarters. But now, we want to think about other places. We want to think about other places in our country and other places in our world. But I want you to know, and I think you know this, and that is that our community is not the same anymore. Our community has changed. Our state has changed. Our churches have changed. It's not what it used to be. We have to understand that. So when he writes this, he's... You could, you could throw in cities like Babylon. Babylon was a city that was known for its evil. You could throw in a city that was Satan's headquarters. Nineveh was a place where Jonah said, I'm not going to go and preach because it's so bad over there. They are so evil. They are so rebellious. They are so anti-God there that I'm not going to go and preach. You could throw in another city. You could throw in cities like Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah that was destroyed because of their sin. You could throw in the city of Rome and their degradation. And then, as I said, you could name American cities. Satan's headquarters. But here, he says, Pergamum. You have become a place where Satan has his headquarters. Look at chapter 2, beginning with verse 12. Let's stand in honor to the Word of God this morning. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know your works and where you dwell. 
I know where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you because you have there those who hold to the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things that are sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. Thus you also have those who hold to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans which things I hate. Repent or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to him some of the hidden manna to eat. And I will give him a white stone and on the stone a new name written which no one knows except him who receives it. You may be seated. Now think about this city. Pergamum or Pergamus known as either one of those, was considered to be the greatest city of Asia Minor at the time of this writing. In fact, it is still a city today in Turkey. It's known as with the name Bergama. But it was the capital of Asia Minor. Now, it was known as being a place where they had a huge library. There were 200,000 written volumes that were in that library. It was known as the center of culture and the center of learning. But it was also known as a center of worship of Greek idols. And when you include some of those, the worship that it took place there, I'll tell you a little bit about the city. There was the Greek god Bacchus, who was the god of revelry. Seems kind of like in our country today when we cut on the television is that we're serving the God of revelry in our own country. Asclepius, who was the God of healing. And we are told that they would come from, people would come from all over the world to come to that place where they would be able to, they say, would be able to be healed. And then there was the cult emperor worship that took place. And that was one of the big things that, that Christians faced that once a year, one day a year, every year, they were called upon to offer a sacrifice to the Roman emperor. Now for a Christian, for a true believer, you would not be able to do that. You would not be able to bow your knee to worship the emperor. And so that's what they were faced with. They had a huge shrine in this city to the god, the Greek god Zeus. The city, as I said, was referred to as being a place of Satan's throne, even though they had all these things about it that, that were known as positive things in that day for this city. But the passage also represents not only an individual city and an individual church, it also represents a church age. As I've said all along with these churches that I'm going to be talking about, you're talking about churches, individual churches of that day. You're talking about church ages. You're talking about characteristics of those churches. And those characteristics of those churches are still in existence today. Every one of these seven churches, there's characteristics of the churches existing today. And so in this particular church age, it, it was between the 4th and the 7th century, and it can be known as the worldly church. The worldly church age. Now what Satan had learned in the previous church, Smyrna, was that persecution was not going to stop the church. He learned that. They grew through persecution. Smyrna exploded in growth through the time of persecution. And so the enemy then decided, not, we're not going to go with the route of persecution. Instead, what we want the church to do is to blend in with society. And we also want the church to become tied to the government. And so that would be the tactic that would be used here in this church age. Constantine would become the emperor of Rome during this time. We are told that Constantine converted to Christianity and he issued the Edict of Milan, 
would basically said that, that now Christianity would be the state religion of the Roman Empire. In fact, some of the things they would do, some have questioned whether or not he was truly converted or not because of the amount of paganism that continued on. But they wrote as many as 50, 50 of the original manuscripts, handwritten, were written during this time. So it's a, it was a special time when it comes to that. But when you think about what took place during this time, was that, that, that the pagan practices of the former Roman Empire prior to the time of Constantine would now be blended into the church. So they took some of the practices of the pagan rituals and the pagan worship and they brought it into the church. And so there was the blending of paganism into the life of the church. Let me give you an example of some of those things that, that would begin. One was that there would, the, 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 the religion would become shrouded, Christianity would become shrouded in ritualism. Paganism and the worship of these Greek gods and the emperor worship and so forth was entrenched in ritual. And what would begin to happen in the life of the church is they took some of those rituals into the life of the church. They took the pagan shrines and they became, because of an edict from, from the emperor, they would become the churches. Guess what? Not only did they become the churches, but the pagan priest would then become the priest that would be working in the churches. They would become the leaders of the church. Can you see the problem with that? Without a genuine, true conversion, that is a huge problem. Where you got lost people that are leading the churches. I want to tell you that we still today, in our society today, in our churches today, we have that happening. We have folks that are proclaiming the gospel that do not believe the word of God. We have people that are teaching in our Sunday school classes today, in Bible studies today, that have never been truly born again in the church today. Some of the pagan practices that would get started during this time in the church that was practicing paganism. What about this one? Praying for the dead. In Pergamos, they would begin to pray for the dead. In the church age, they would begin to pray for the dead. It is a practice that is still practiced by some today. I, I remember going to a service one time when I was growing up. It was a funeral service for one of my friend's mother. And I went to that service, and I've never been to one like it before because I grew up Southern Baptist. So I'd never been in one of those services. And I went in the service, and the priest began to pray for the person that was dead. Now me, I sat there, and I said to the person next to me, he ain't doing him no, or her no good. Because praying for the dead is not going to get you anywhere. We pray for people that are alive, but the practice of praying for the dead. And then that evolved into the practice of eventually bam being baptized in behalf of the dead. Can you hear me? Being baptized, that's among some groups today. Being, we're going to be baptized in behalf of someone that's already been gone on before us. And then they began the worship of the saints in AD 375. Proclamation would be that you would begin to worship saints and you begin to worship angels. In AD 431 during this church age would be the beginning of the worship of Mary. I want to tell you that Mary only worshiped one when she was here. And she never desired worship for herself. She always pointed people to worshiping her son. To worshiping the Christ. And so we're not called upon to worship Mary or to pray to Mary. Yet you can go to Italy and, and, and we're told in Italy that the number one person that is prayed to in Italy is not Jesus. He's on down the line. He's not even in the top three. It's the one that's prayed to. Mary is number one. This is where it got started. It got started in Pergamos. It got started in the uh, Pergamum church age. The worship of Mary. And then the extreme unction got started where the observing of sacraments to give last rites to those that are dying or those that are dead. Giving a last rites to someone that's dead. That got, it, got started. Listen to me, friends. What I'm telling you right now is things that are not biblical. 
that are being practiced today. They are not biblical. They are not scriptural. You see where the church gets off course. It gets off the track here. Purgatory. In AD 593, purgatory was introduced. In AD 600, they began to pray, literally to pray to Mary then. Now the word Pergamum. The word Pergamum means marriage. The church during this age became married to the government. The church became married to the government. Because remember, Constantine said that now the official church of the Roman Empire is going to be Christianity. And so the church became married to the government. And what happened was that the church was elevated to a point of acceptance but when they were elevated to a point of acceptance by the government, they declined in their power and they declined in the blessing of God upon them. Now listen, there are a lot of, of emphasis today, a lot of things that are going on behind the scenes today to get the church today to become more tied to the government. We better be very cautious. We better be very understanding that the government should have no control over what goes on in the church. That we are not connected to the governor, a government in that way. We are to pray for the government. We are to pray. We are to be as submissive as possible. But we're not tied to the government. We lose our power when the government begins to tell the church what the church is going to do. And that's what they did. That's what they did in the Roman Empire. They told the church what to do. And then another thing that got started in this church age was a thing called postmillennialism. Postmillennialism. Postmillennialism is the view, it is the view that Jesus Christ will come after a thousand years of peace and prosperity on earth. Did you hear what I said? Postmillennialism means that Jesus will come at the end of a thousand years. That view began to be promoted during this period of time. Now, about, about the year, about the 19th century, people began to realize that wasn't happening. Have you noticed that things are not any better? Have you noticed that they're not progressively getting better? We have not had a thousand years of peace. I want to tell you that you and I know that we will only have a thousand years of peace and prosperity on earth when Jesus comes again. That's when it will take place. That's when the millennium will take place. And that's when there will be a time of bliss. When the church has a strong emphasis when a church has a strong emphasis on the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, they are a church that is evangelistic and a church that will be mission-minded. But when you think that mad Jesus is not coming anytime soon, there's a lack of evangelism and a lack of urgency. I want to tell you, in the last few years, I've become more urgent in my spirit about missions and evangelism and reaching the world for Christ. Our time is running out. Now, the nature of Christ was revealed to Pergamum. Jot this into your outline right at the beginning. Hadn't even got there yet, have I? The, the beginning, when Jesus speaks, this should have been in your outline, really. But the nature of Christ is revealed to Pergamum. The nature of Christ is revealed to each one of the churches. He's going to real, reveal something about his nature. When he writes in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 1 to the church at Ephesus, he says, these things says... He who holds the seven stars his, in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. This is the reference to Jesus who walks in and controls and leads his churches. And then, down in chapter 2 and verse 8, to the angel of the church of Smyrna write, or to the pastor, or to the messenger, these things says the first and the last who was dead and who has come to life. The first and the last. Jesus said, that's me. And now what does he write to Pergamum, though? What he writes to Pergamum is, he says that these things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. 
Now, the sharp two-edged sword is representative of the Word of God. What is he saying to Pergamum? What is he saying to us? He's saying to us that the only cure, the only cure for what ails us now, the only cure for what ails our church now, the only cure for what ails our society now is the Word of God. Two-edged sword. The only cure for Pergamum is the two-edged sword. He says, if you would pay attention to this, he says, there will be change. There will be revival. It's a two-edged sword. And so this and it pictures for us, though, that Jesus Christ is the judge. He's presenting himself to the church at Pergamum as the judge, but he's also presenting himself to the church of Pergamum as the executioner. He is judge. Listen to me. I want to remind you that Jesus Christ is our judge, but Jesus Christ is also the executioner. He's the one that's going to carry out the sentence. And then notice the com commendation of Jesus. What did he say to them? How did he commend them? He's, it's going to fall into three categories. He says, I know that you live in Satan's headquarters. He's going to commend them. He says, I know things are hard. I know you live in Satan's headquarters. As I said, the headquarters had been at Rome, but now we find it here at, at, at Pergamos. And his approach during the Pergamum church age for, for the, the enemy was indulgence. To indulge the society around them, not persecution. So become a part of society. Just, just, we want to become part of the world. I want to tell you, one of the problems in our churches today is our churches are so worldly. One of the problems in our lives individually is that we are so focused on the world. Well, he says, I know you live in Satan's headquarters. But then he says, you are doctrinally pure. And at this point when he writes, there was more doctrinal purity than what there was as the age went on. There was doctrinal purity, and this is what he says. He says that during this church age, well, actually, he, he doesn't say it here, but what happens in this church age is that there were rituals, their rituals became equal with Scripture. Now listen, how we do things, the rituals that we carry out are not equal with Scripture. You got some groups today that say that their, that their rituals, their rituals are equal with Scripture. And we know that that's not according to the Word of God. And then what else happened? Another thing that happened during this time is there was something called, jot this down, look at it, Google it, the Arian controversy. There was the Arian controversy. This is one of the things that he commit, what they would be commended for. It was the council in Nicaea at A.D. 325. Arius, here's the point of it. Arius denied the deity of Jesus. Do we have a whole host of folks today in our world denying the deity of Jesus? I point it out. Someone I hope you don't watch on CNN. Donald Lemon. My goodness, the things he says. But then he's denying the deity of Jesus right there, on, right there on television. But it's not just him, it's everywhere. But listen, there's a guy in the church, Arius, who denied the personal deity of Jesus. They said that Jesus Christ was the greatest of all created beings. But he was not one with the Father. Now what does that sound like? That sounds exactly like Jehovah's Witnesses. That's what Jehovah's Witnesses teach. Jesus was a great man, but he was not one with the Father. He was not deity. What was the conclusion of this council? The conclusion of the Arian council in this controversy was this. The conclusion was that Jesus Christ was declared to be very God of very God. In other words, no doubt, listen to me, no doubt the church spoke and said that Jesus Christ is God. And we still stand on that today. That Jesus Christ is God. And then he goes on to tell them, you have not denied my faith. And he gives one example of that. You know, there's a remnant always. There's a remnant in every church. There's a remnant in every church age of those that are faithful. There was a guy by the name of Antipas. 
He says that he gave his life as a martyr. He was faithful in his testimony of his faith with his blood. Tradition tells us that what happened to Antipas and what was happening to some of the others at that time was that, that he was roasted to death inside a brass bull during the persecution by Domitian. Roasted to death. And we think we got it bad. But he was faithful all the way till death. You've not denied my faith. And then what was the condemnation by Christ? Their practical doctrines were evil. They practiced in their church the doctrine of Balaam. Now I want to remind you of the story of Balaam real quick. Balaam's story is found in Numbers 22 through 25 and, and further. Balaam, he was the guy who was riding the donkey to try to go and curse the Israelites. And the donkey stopped, remember? The donkey stopped and turned around and said, I ain't going no further. Why are you beating me? He gone off the way, gone off. The, you read the story. The donkey spoke. He went off the path. He beat him back in the line. He says, I'm not going any further. Why are you beating me? But Balaam was hired by Balak, who was the king of the Moabites, who hired Balaam to curse the Israelites. Three times he tried to. Three times he tried to curse them. He was a prophet for hire. But then each time it wouldn't work. God stopped it. So this is what he did. He tried to lure, he lured the Jewish men, the Hebrew men, into marrying Moabite women. And that worked. Because they began to intermarry with the Moabites and began to practice all of their immorality. He says here, he says here, listen, that when the cursing wouldn't work, if you can't curse them, if you can't caress, curse them, you corrupt them. And that's what's happening today. Our churches are weak because we're corrupt. We have sin in our lives. As, as, as she sang a while ago, I surrender all. We have, we're, we're, we're up there and we're singing it full voice. And we know there are things in our life that need to be confessed. We can't be right with God until we repent and turn. This was a picture of the church at Pergamum. They were polluted socially. They were polluted spiritually. They did not remain separated from the world. They mixed with the pagans, and the pagans soon dominated. I'm going to tell you something. You mix with the wrong crowd. You mix with the wrong crowd. They will eventually lead you astray. Their coins showed Christian emblems on one side and heathen gods on the other side during this, this particular age. And then there was the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, of which God said this. Catch this. God says, I hate it. I hate the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. What was some of their doctrines? One of their doctrines was that they promoted ecclesiastical hierarchy in the church. In other words, ecclesiastical hierarchy over the laity. This was rejected by the Ephesian church. Go back and read it. They rejected the deeds of the Nicolaitans. And that's in other words, say, well, we're going to have a pope, and, and, and we're going to have all this, this leadership trickle down from the top to being over the church, ecclesiastical authorities. Listen, who is the authority? Who's the authority of the church? Who is the head of the church? But they got away from that to ecclesiastical authority being over the churches. The head is Jesus. The head of the church is not the pope. The head of the church is not the archbishops and, the, and, and, and so forth that some groups have over the head. And the, and the Bible says here they hated this doctrine where laymen got to the point in this church a lay people had no voice the preacher dominated the church clergy became more and more separate from the laity i want I, I, we need to understand today that ministers 
cannot lose contact with the church. That's what was happening during that time. And one of the challenges that we face even right now, that ministers are facing right now, is the sense somehow or another that due to all that's going on, that, that we're losing some contact with the people. And folks, listen to me. That is what the enemy wants to do. Listen to me. He wants me to lose contact with you, you to lose contact with me, us to lose contact with one another. Hello, help me out. That's what he wants to do. We're seeing so much of that today. The pastor must do as Paul searched the scriptures, preach the word, do the work of an evangelist, deal with personally with unsaved men. But let me tell you something. There's something else that this group promoted was sexual immorality. The Nicolaitans promoted sexual immorality. Sexual rights in the church. They saw no problem with you being sexually immoral and still being able to be a part of the church and to be able to come and join the church and have leadership positions in the church. They saw no, saw no problem with sexual promiscuity in the church. One of the great problems we got in the church today is we, as the church, we may say in our doctrine, we may say in our thoughts, we may say in our minds, we don't believe in premarital sex. We don't believe in extramarital sex. We don't believe in homosexuality. Yet what is being practiced is not always what we say that we believe. And our churches are messed up because of it. And then what was the counsel of Christ? The counsel of Christ was repent or be judged by the word of God. Repent or be judged. Now, for the church at Pergamos, the church was a compromising church. They compromised with the enemy. They tolerated false teachers. And one reason why there's little power in the church today is because there's way too much compromise. Way too much compromise in the church today. You know what? We, we as a church today, churches today, we want to make everybody happy. Preachers want to make everybody happy. I, I understand this. I've been doing this long enough time to know I can't make everybody happy. And a church, by the way, where everybody's happy, everybody's feeling good, probably in all likelihood a church where truth's not being proclaimed maybe the way it needs to be. Because when you preach the word, listen to me, when the word of pre is preached, some people are going to get offended. Some people are going to say, you know what, I, I don't really want to go there. They're they too strong. Some people are going to be offended. This is what I believe about the church. The church is a hospital for sinners, but it is a place where sinners can come and get well. It's not a place where we just come and continue on with what we're doing. It's a place where we come and get well. And you know what sometimes needs to happen for you to be able to get well? Those of you in the medical profession, no doctor knows here, and that is you've got to have surgery. You've got to have some things removed you got a cancer that needs to be removed. The church helps us to be able to do that. To be able to get rid of some of those things that we need to get rid of. The counsel of Christ, repent or be judged. The final thing, the challenge of Christ is directed to overcomers. Who are the overcomers? People that are born again. People that are truly born again. Again, Billy Graham said four years before he died, he thought probably 75% of the folks in churches today weren't truly born again. Truly born again people are those that are overcomers. And he says, I will give to them hidden manna. I want you to get this. If you don't get nothing else, hear this. Hear this. I want you to hear that given to overcomers is a hidden manna. That manna was a heavenly food that was given to those in Jews in the, the Hebrews in the Old Testament. This hidden manna for overcomers is representative of the J Jesus Christ. This is representative here of the coming of Christ. And he's saying to them, to the overcomers, what, what I have for you is that all of your needs will be supplied. All your needs will be supplied by 
the Lord Jesus Christ. And the, the, the sending of the manna is representative of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. For who? Not for all church members, but for overcomers. And then he said, I'll give you a white stone. White stone. White stone. You know, when a jury in that day declared someone innocent and acquitted them, they gave them a white stone. I've given you a white stone for those of us that are overcomers. He gives to us the white stone. We have been acquitted. We have been acquitted of our sin. We ought to be able to walk out of here with a big hallelujah on that one, huh? We've been given, he said, I give you a white stone. It was also given to athletes when they won a, 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 an event and they got up on the stand. They were given white stones of victory in Christ. In Christ, we are acquitted. In Christ, we are victorious. And no matter all this other stuff, <laughs> if you're an overcomer, you're victorious. Father, thank you for the day. Thank you for the opportunity to be able to preach your word, to be able to praise you, to be able to sing your word today. Father, I pray now that we respond to you. Lord, if we've never been saved, God, that we would have heard the gospel today and understand that, that we can be saved, we can be born again. Lord, I pray for folks here today. Pray for folks in this building. Pray for folks next door that need a personal relationship with you. Oh, God, I pray today. I pray today that they will seek you. I pray that they would cry out to you. I pray that they would surrender their life to you, just like we heard some. And then, Lord, I pray for believers today. That, Lord, we be reminded today of just how blessed we are and just how blessed we are as an overcomer. But also recognize, Father, that we need to repent or be judged by the Word of God. And there's those areas of our life that we need to repent of or we'll be judged by the book, be judged by the Word of God. Lord, we give this time to you now. Help us to do what you want us to do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Brother Larry, lead us, please.